everybody, welcome back to the shop. Hey, I wanted to shoot a quick video this morning and uh, show you guys the things that maybe aren't all that good. Uh, I've, over the last year since I've built it, uh, I've discovered some things about my design that, that aren't the best. And if I were to do it again, I would do differently. There's nothing about this video where I'm going to say, oh yeah, and it doesn't move right. No, it's not like that. I finished this machine January 3rd of last year. So it's been 13 months, basically. And I've run a number of jobs, learning to do different things. Uh, and it has been very consistent and has continued to run. I haven't had any actual running issues. Let's get into this. Um, I'm just gonna walk around it a little bit and as I see things that I wanna point out, yes, this works really well, or yeah, this right here, not so much, um, I'll share them with you. Let's take a look at, at what I got going on here. With hindsight being what it is and recognizing now that I'm not gonna use this table and framework to be both plasma and spindle, I would not make all the spindle components separate. Um, and I, I'm considering it now with the only one minor exception, but I would like to take and, and put the spindle controller and the control box and all of that good stuff and mount it right underneath the machine itself along with the uh, water reservoir, which is what that bucket is right there. I would like to mount all of that stuff right under the table. In fact, where I'm thinking about putting it is down here under this end. I should have made this bar here higher up so I could slide a five gallon bucket underneath it. My choice now is to find a different reservoir that will slide in, you know, some sort of a square bucket. You know, it, it's not, uh, not a showstopper, just something that I would do differently. All right, here's one that I haven't done this way, and, and I'll make the suggestion to those of you out there who are still considering your design, and that is, um, if you're, and, and you should, <laughs> if, you're, if you're not thinking you, you want one now, you will, uh, if you're going to have some sort of a touch-off plate or a zeroing fixture, uh, run wires and make accommodations for it so that when it's not in use, it can be you know, sitting here on the axis because you're gonna want that right here at the spindle every time. Um, the way I've got mine set up, uh, it will be connected back to the podium and, and there won't be any cables running through here. And the downside is the cables won't be running through the gantry. They'll be more over here in my way. And that one's easy enough I could fix if it bothers me too much. I'm not a big fan of this. This is uh, how I'm supporting the uh, coolant tubes for the water-cooled spindle as well as the power that goes to the spindle. And does it work? Yes. Is it effective? Yes. It just looks terrible. Um, I think if I had some more flexible, some, some tubing that was a little more flexible, maybe even this clear stuff would do it, uh, I would like to run it more out over the end somehow. Um, if I had really flexible tubing, uh, you know, run it through, through the cable track. But this overhead thing, is just, it's just messy and I think that's what I don't like about it. My control podium, overall, I really like it. It was definitely the right thing to do. The thing I'm looking at now that I would do differently has to do with the reuse of this podium on the CNC plasma table I'm going to build. What I did was I put plugs in the side of the machine, in the side of the control box. And then it's hardwired on the machine end. So all those cables are now hardwired over here into the individual stepper motors and, and over to the control box for the spindle. Well, the problem with that is when I build the other machine, I have to repurchase all the cable. It's not a big deal, but honestly, I think I should have left the cables hardwired into the control box and plugs on the machine itself. 
So on the side of the control cabinet over here, you can see these these fasteners, these connectors down here. These are a, a aircrafty style connector that's got a screw on collar that keeps them seated. And and these are pretty nice and and they're not uh, they're not expensive. You can buy them on Flea Bay. A uh, little uh, I think these are I think these are four pins. Yeah, little four pin connectors. They're keyed and everything, not a problem. The reason I bring them up, I better plug that in or I'll wonder why the x-axis doesn't work. The reason I bring them up is because the other day I was uh, at the surplus store, plug for them, Midwest Surplus Electronics in Fairborn, Ohio, and I needed a connector. I, I was looking for a connector so I could finish wiring up my spindle. And they showed me various different ones until I, they finally showed me these. And these are actually mic connectors. And they have a locking tab and they work super well. This happens to be a four pin. I have a three pin on the other side for my, uh, my tool height um, sensor. And anyways, they're an interesting option. So, you know, if you have access to uh, mic plugs, that's what this is here. I have to say the number one biggest design flaw in this is the way that the y-axis rails or tubes are connected to what I call the adapter plate. This is what I call the XY adapter plate if you've seen the drawings. <clears throat> the tubes that make up the gantry are, are two inch tubes, two inch square tubing. If you look down in here, you can see the head of a socket head cap screw. And there's two of them. There's one here, and there's one down here just a little bit further. And the problem with it is you can't get to them. You can get to them through holes I've put in the top. You can see a hole right here. And there's another one, but the other one is underneath this rail. And so it it doesn't take long to figure out oh well that's dumb Preston if you want to take off or do something with this plate down here or these bearings if they need to be adjusted you not only have to take off the rails which means you have to take off the entire x-axis <laughs> you, you see the problem everything has to come apart to get to those two socketed cap screws and that is the biggest design flaw I've got <clears throat> what could be done about it? Honestly, I think it could be as simple as cutting relief holes here and another one here in the side such that you could get in there with an Allen wrench, probably a modified one where you've cut down its length a little. That would probably be the best thing to do. Or the other thing to do is fasten them from the bottom up. If I had tack welded a nut inside this tube, here and here, then I could have made the fastener come in from the bottom and that would solve the problem as well. But this right here, biggest issue I've got. When I machined all the aluminum plates, I countersank and used uh, flat-headed screws everywhere. Um, these happen to be holding on the bearings. This hole in the center is just a, an opening so you can get to the bearing adjustment. But all of these that I did that way, where I was relying on the Chinese bearings to be, um, to be square and, and in line, uh, I would not do that way. I would do them with either a button head or a regular socket head cap screw, something on top that laid on top that I could oversize the hole a few thousandths and give me a little bit of play. The problem with doing it this way is those holes are all very precise. I put them in on my milling machine. I know they're in the right spot, but that taper creates a wedge and they will not go anywhere except that one spot. The trouble there is these bearing blocks, you need a little fudge factor for inexpensive Chinese flea bay bearing blocks. I'll put a card here. Uh, for the video I did on on those and you'll understand better why if you watch it. I think I would reconsider the computer I'm using to control the machine. This is a 64-bit Windows 7 machine. It has given me absolutely no trouble. I bought it used. 
it has an Ethernet smooth stepper board in it. So I'm not actually using the parallel ports that are on it, which was the primary reason for buying this one. I, I'd have to look a little further, but I think I would be exploring using some of the USB stepper boards. My opinion in this is the newer you can keep your hardware, the better. All right, Brent, that was what I wanted to share with you guys around what I've learned uh, having run this machine for a while now. I didn't talk much about the things I liked. I love it. Um, I like being able to draw something up, come out here and, and have a machine cut it. I, I don't do square corners anymore <laughs> because curves are so much easier. Everything's rounded or has a fillet. Um, but uh, anyways, as far as the design overall goes, it does really well. It does exactly what I wanted it to. It does wood, it does plastics. I made this thing on it, and this is uh, this is a block of aluminum. So I have no regrets with how I, I did the machine, I built the machine. Would I do it a little different next time? Yeah, I, I would, but nothing systemic. So, hey, good luck on your design and your build, uh, and if you're just sitting on the couch thinking about it, you know, give it a try. You can make them a lot smaller than this for a lot less money. Um, in fact, sitting over there, I've got all the pieces to make a, a little tiny one. I thought I would need that to sort of practice learning how to, to control it and do my G-code. Um, honestly, don't, jump in, jump in. It's, uh, it's easy enough to learn. There's lots of ways you can uh, try things out before you actually drive a cutter into a piece of material and uh, you'll get comfortable with it so fast. I, I got comfortable with it so fast that the other one's still sitting over there in pieces. So, all right, everybody. Thanks for stopping by the shop. You folks have a good afternoon.